Father, we thank you. Uh, we realize that, God, without faith, it is impossible to please you. And, God, I pray that you will continue to shape us all here as men and women of faith who live by faith and not by sight, God, Lord. Uh, we thank you that, that God, that you are the God of the more than. Uh, you are more than able to intervene, to work. To, you, you're able to go more than we can possibly dare to imagine or even dream, God. And I pray that, God, as your church and as your people, God, that we will step into the fullness of all that you have for us, God. And we ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I just want to, again, just uh, reaffirm what Kate said earlier on uh, today about our family service uh, at five o'clock, if you could come along to that, it'd be great. This is important for us as a church because um, I'm always looking at ways of how we can build bridges into our community. Uh, we know we have a really good children's work. Uh, Kate does a great work with the children's work, and uh, uh, obviously we're taking steps and venturing into the community. But I'm always thinking ways how can we bridge the community into the life of the church? And so our family services this uh, this afternoon at five o'clock is one of those bridges. It's a great opportunity for us to mix uh, with people. So if you can make it uh, this afternoon, uh, that will be absolutely fantastic. And I also just want to give a word of thanks just to everyone in the life of this church for your giving and for your service and for your prayers. It is much appreciated. Uh, you know, without your support, without your prayers, without your giving, without volunteering of your time, uh, you know, we couldn't do what we do as a church. And, uh, you know, for us particularly as we come into a, a new season as a church. I do feel we're coming into a new season. Uh, um, it, it's actually going to be, more is going to be required of us, uh, you know, uh, to go to another level. But I just want to say, guys, thank you for everything that you've done up to now. And uh, let's move forward, hey? God's, got a, God's a good God, and he's got a great future uh, for us. Now, what I want to speak to you this morning is <laughs> on the subject of shame. A bit of a sensitive subject, I know. But you know, it is God's desire for all of us here today to be able to approach Him without shame. You know, many people carry shame in their life. It's one of those things that uh, it's, it, it can be a burden to bear, it can, it can, the guilt that sometimes we carry. Uh, but wonderful news is that God does not want you to carry your shame on your own, He wants to take it from you. I don't know, when you was at school, um, um, some of you, it was fairly recent, for some of you it was a long time ago, but you remember uh, when you know, the teacher would do, the, you know, do, do a class and then the, the teacher would say, right, in so many weeks from now, you're going to have a test. And, uh, and so you revise furiously for the test and you try your best. It's not the easiest of subjects, but you try your best. You work hard, the day comes, or well, some of you try the best. <laughs> Maybe some of you thought, I can't be bothered. And, and the day comes, you do the exam, and you do the test, and then the teacher marks the papers, and then the day comes for the test results to be revealed. Now, I was guilty of this in my teaching years, I say to my embarrassment, but the teacher publicly reads the results to the whole class. And uh, one by one, the teacher names so-and-so got this result, so-and-so got this result, and then when it comes to you, your result is read out in front of the whole class, and guess what? It's the lowest mark in the whole class. Now, how would you feel in that situation? You probably feel embarrassed. Probably feel, you know, all of a sudden you feel that you're going to be judged by your peers, and your peers are looking down at you and thinking, oh, did you see what so-and-so got? Did you see what Gwen got on her result? It was really bad. <laughs> and, so, um, and so that sense of, of shame, that sense of embarrassment can sometimes creep in, and we all experience shame at different levels and, and, and guilt at different levels, depending on how sensitive our conscience is, depending on our upbringing. But with this, I think it's important to understand that shame is a bit of a double-edged sword in the sense that it is healthy. Now, hear what I'm saying. It's healthy to feel ashamed for something that you know you've done wrong. So when you've done something you knew that was wrong, it is healthy to feel ashamed. In fact, I would say there's something wrong if you didn't feel ashamed. Because with that shame comes a sense of, okay, I need to put that right. I'm going to put that right. I know for myself, I think we all can save our own lives. There are things in my past I thought I was ashamed at how I reacted in that situation. 
And I thought, I need, I realize I have a problem and I need to put it right. And it caused me to, to make some changes. You know, we've, and so there's a sense that where it can be healthy. But there's also a sense where it can be unhealthy. So it's unhealthy to stay in shame. It's unhealthy, unhealthy to stay in guilt. Even when things have happened in the past and uh, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to move on with your life, but that sense of shame, that sense of guilt weighs over you and it limits you from moving forward. It confines you from moving forward. Um, you, know, you, you feel withdrawn socially. You, can't, you don't feel that you can interact with people. You don't feel that you can serve God the way that God would want you to serve. You know? And, 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 the, and the reality is that in those situations, shame is something that God says, you just need to bring it to me and let me deal with that. Because I have a wonderful future for you and I don't want that guilt or that shame to rob you of the purpose that God has for your life. Think about of our first parents in the garden, Adam and Eve. What did they do? <laughs> they disobeyed God. <laughs> what was the first thing that happened? The first thing they noticed was we're naked. <laughs> and what was the first emotion they experienced? Shame. Guilt. And what did they do? They tried to find some fig leaves, sow some fig leaves, cover themselves, cover their nakedness. What happened when God was walking in the cool of the day? They hid themselves from the presence of God. You see, that's exactly what shame does, doesn't it? Shame, guilt, carrying it, it causes us to hide ourselves from each other. It, it, it removes vulnerability and it causes us to hide ourselves from, from God. And instead of running to God, we run away from God. But the wonderful truth is this. You don't have to be perfect to please God <laughs> when you come to Him in faith. When you come to God in faith, you don't have to be perfect to please God because God has made a way to deal with our shame. Now, wonderful. In fact, in that story of Adam and Eve, God sets in place a motion, a process by which he is going to deal with this universal human problem that every human being experiences called shame. And God says to Adam and Eve, we read here in the book of Genesis, that the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. Their attempts to cover their shame was completely inadequate. Only God could do something in their life to take away their sense of shame. And notice, it was the skin of an animal. <laughs> Guess what? An animal had to die. Blood had to be shed so that their shame and their guilt can be covered. So as we continue this series, The Essential Life, we're, again, we're looking at this faith that we need that pleases God. I've been looking at Hebrews chapter 11, this great chapter of men and women of faith. And uh, we've been looking at some truths from this faith. We've been looking at, last week we saw that today's outlook affects tomorrow's outcome. We've looked at the importance of our spiritual health is of greater value than our physical health, that, that uh, people of faith forge identity that is not of this world. But I want to take hold of this truth today that you don't have to be perfect to please God when you come to Him in faith. And I want to ask, how can we approach God without shame? So let's look at Hebrews uh, chapter 11 again. And uh, the writer of Hebrews says this as follows. He says, By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life, so that he did not experience death. He could not be found, because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And then goes, instead they, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Listen to this. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Isn't that interesting? Sometimes God can get embarrassed by the behavior of those who are made in his image and likeness. It's a bit like parents can get embarrassed with their children, okay? But therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead, and so in a manner speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. By faith, he, Moses, 
a few verses later, kept the Passover and the application of blood so the destroyer of the firstborn will not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed of those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? <laughs> I don't have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jetha, and David, and Samuel, and the prophets. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised since God has planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, listen to this, endured the cross, scorning its shame. Scorning its shame. And sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. So you don't have to be perfect to please God. <laughs> if you come to him in faith. You know, when we look at the lives of these men and women that we've just looked at in Hebrews chapter 11, it doesn't take too long to realize that they all had a past. <laughs> they all had skeletons in their closet, the things that they would have felt ashamed about. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, let's say they had an economical relationship with the truth. They weren't always forthright on things. Moses was a murderer. Rahab, a prostitute. Gideon and Barak had cowardice leanings. Samson, a problem with lust. Jephthah experienced the shame of rejection in his life. David, we all know about David, don't we? Committed, a mur committed adultery and murdered someone to cover up for his sin, thinking he got away with it when he did it. Because God knows everything, doesn't he? You can't hide anything from God. And isn't it remarkable that the writer of Hebrews wants to mention these people? And I think that's something important for us to learn, because he is, the writer is saying that actually, in spite of their past, in spite of the, the things that have gone on in their life, they were made right before God. They could approach God without shame because they came before God on his terms in faith. So how then can we approach God without shame? The first thing we need to do is that we need to see God for who he is. We need to get our, shame, our sense of shame, our guilt, in its right perspective. I think sometimes we carry guilt in our life that in the grand scheme of things, guys, is not that important. You know, if you've got the lowest mark in that class... <laughs> Hey, don't be beating yourself up about that. You know, it's, you know there's, there's some things that are much more important. And, and, and I mentioned earlier on that, that our, our sense of shame is a bit of a double-edged sword because obviously it's healthy to feel shame if you've done something that you know is wrong, but it's not healthy to stay in shame. Our culture today, and our Western culture particularly, has gone to the other extreme. In our Western culture, we, we don't feel ashamed about certain things. In fact, annually we take pride in things that God looks at and deems as shameful. And, uh, and, and we, you're even, it's even deemed to be shameful, not to celebrate the shameful. That's where our culture is going right now in our, in our Western world. And so that's one extreme. You go to another extreme, you go to some parts of the world, like in the Far East or in the Middle East, where they have like an honor culture. And you're part of a family. And you know what? You've got, to, you've got to marry within a certain clan or whatever. And, you know, and if you don't live your life like this, we will label you. We will instill shame on you. And, uh, and you know, we get these things like honor killings that, that happen. And so there's two extremes. The West has one problem. You know, and, and the other parts will have another problem. So who decides what is right or wrong? Who decides the things that we 
should feel embarrassed about and things that we shouldn't feel embarrassed about. Well, it's not for you and it's not for me. <laughs> it's not for majority public opinion because let me tell you something, the majority doesn't always get it right. You know, like 400 or 300 years ago, slavery was quite common. People, it was acceptable. We look back at it now and think, no, that wasn't acceptable. There are things our culture to do today that are not acceptable. And maybe 100 years from now, if there's another 100 years, people will look at this, you did that in this generation. Who decides what is right and wrong? Should I tell you? God. God is the reference point of what is right and wrong. And sometimes our sense of values doesn't always line up to how God sees things. You see, God is holy. <laughs> he is holy. And those who come to him are called, are, are called by his name, are called to be holy. Earlier, when the writer of Hebrews says that both the one who makes people holy and those who are, ma and those who are made holy are of the same family, so Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters. In other words, by implication, the writer of Hebrews says is this, God gets embarrassed <laughs> when there's no holiness in our life. When there's a lack of holiness, actually God feels quite embarrassed by it. And it's actually a cause for shame. And that means that when you identify yourself with the family of God, there's a behavior that God wants us to live by. There's, there's an appropriate way that we live our lives. And that unholiness is a cause for shame. But let me tell you something. You don't need to stay in shame. <laughs> you don't need to stay there. Because when you've placed your trust in Jesus, do you know what he does? He makes you holy. <laughs> not me, not you. I can't make myself, myself holy. You can't make yourself holy. None of us can make ourselves holy. In fact, if you try to do it, you'll only beat yourself up with more guilt. And you'll go to... One, to one of two extremes, either religious pride and you think you're better than others, or despair. You think, woe is me. No, none of us can make ourselves holy. Only God working in us can make us holy as we learn every day to put our trust and our confidence in who he is. And that is why the re that's the reason why the writer of Hebrews later says in the book of Hebrews that God is not ashamed to be called their God. Why? Because these men and women of faith they walked out their journey of faith. <laughs> they didn't have it all together. None of them had it perfect. And yet, because they approached God in faith, they were pleasing before God. You don't have to be perfect to please God when you come to Him in faith. The second way that we can approach God without shame is we need to see the value that He places upon human life. Have you ever noticed that as Human beings, something very unique about us. We wear clothes. <laughs> other creatures, as far as I know, don't. In fact, other creatures have got fur on, haven't they? I think there's something divine about that. <laughs> Somewhere in the beginning of creation. You don't see a chimpanzee jumping around wearing a jacket. Like, oh, I just made this. You don't see that. As human beings, we are the only creatures who blush. We get embarrassed. <laughs> I didn't see that in any other animal. Why is that? Because, shall I tell you why? We are made in the image and likeness of God. We are moral creatures. That's, not, that's unlike any other. We have a conscience. Because we're made in God's image and likeness. We, there's other aspects of our uniqueness. We, we have this amazing ability to think outside of ourselves. We're self-aware. We're creative. Those are all traits of being made in the image and likeness of God that sets us apart from any other creature. And therefore, with this amazing privilege of being made in God's image and likeness, there's also a responsibility that comes with that as well. Because we are responsible for our choices. And it presents a problem because, like I said, it's healthy to feel ashamed of what you know is wrong, but it's not healthy to stay in shame. And so many people throughout the whole centuries have always dealt with this issue of shame and guilt, and they've wondered, how do I get rid of my guilt? 
How do I get rid of all the things in my life that I know that I've done wrong? And so, so, so often in times past in ancient cultures, they would take an animal. And this is the only way they, they, they thought they could do it. They'd take an animal, they would go to their god or their deity who they worship, they would kill the animal, and they would sprinkle the blood of the animal upon the altar to their god in the hope that maybe it would atone for their guilty conscience. But you know what? It couldn't do anything. <laughs> did nothing to change the heart. The ancient Israelites did that when they came before God. They they bring, you know, if you was a if you if you did something you knew was wrong, okay, what you would do, uh, you'd go and get over oh, I've sinned today. <laughs> okay, who hasn't sinned? Today? Like who can't, who can't go a day? Okay, I'm on, I'm gonna go there. Okay, I've sinned today. <laughs> I bring my goat to the priest at the tent of meeting. The priest will slaughter the goat to, to actually atone for my iniquity and guilt. And yet, and yet, the blood of that animal was not sufficient to cleanse our conscience. The writer of Hebrews says that it is impossible, impossible. There's the other impossible in the book of Hebrews. Impossible to please God without faith. But it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Why is that? Because animal life is of a different category to human life. We're made in God's image and likeness. And that, what that means is this. It is only the life of another human who's lived a perfect and sinless life if that person gave his life for your life, then there may be power to cleanse your conscience before God so that you can approach him without sin. Now, God completely denounced human sacrifice. In fact, all the ancient pagan cultures of the ancient world, it was quite common for them to sacrifice their children to their gods. It was an evil thing. God denounced it. But, it was a, but the only thing that can cleanse our conscience is the blood of someone like us. And this now leads us to the, the final way that we, we, we can approach God without shame, and that is this, that we need to see Jesus for what he has done. You see, Jesus, and only Jesus, only Jesus, has the power to take away your shame. <laughs> Jesus, and only Jesus, has the power to remove the, all those things of your past that you feel embarrassed about. Why? Because be both fully God and fully human in one person. His blood, the shedding of his blood, make, avails a power to reach into the deep places, the deep re recesses of the human soul to set us free from the things that we regret. When by faith Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did, by faith, the Bible says he was commended as right, righteous. You see, Abel's faith, he understood how he had to approach God's presence. He couldn't approach God's presence like his brother Cain by the work of his hands. He had to go into the presence of God by the blood of another. And his faith foreshadowed the work of Christ in the future. That only through the blood of Christ can we come into the presence of God. We're ashamed is removed, that the life of an innocent was required to come into God's presence. You know, some people have real problems with this. A lot of people say, why, why all the blood? <laughs> oh, I don't like blood. Do you like blood? No, no I don't, none of us like blood. Why was this all necessary? You know, why all this? It's all, you know, you know, some people have real issues with it. And I understand. But I'll tell you why. Because the life is in the blood. And when we've sinned against God, who is the source of life, that source of life is cut off. It's totally cut off. And so the only way we can reconnect with that source of life is through someone else's life. <laughs> and if it's not our life, it needs to be the life of someone who lived a perfect life, the life of Jesus. When by faith Moses and the Israelites, they kept the Passover and the application of the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn. The blood of the Passover lamb serves as a picture of what Jesus has done for us. And when you see Jesus as your Passover lamb, you are spared 
God's judgment on your life. You're spared the wrath of God. In fact, in the book of Exodus, after the Passover lamb was slaughtered, the Israelites had to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses. And the application of blood on the sides and the tops of the door frames was an act of faith. <laughs> it was an act of faith before God. And the Lord says that on that same night, the Lord says, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both of people and animals, and I'll bring judgment on the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord, and the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over, and no destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. It's powerful, isn't it? Very, very powerful. You know, I, I, you know the, the Word of God, the Bible, gets right to the very heart of the issue. The blood of Christ reaches the deep places of our, our, our human soul that like no psychology can do. And this concept of the application of the blood to be spared God's judgment, to enter his presence, is something that runs throughout the whole of Scripture. In fact, the, the, the priests I mentioned earlier on, they would come into God's presence. What would they have to do? They have to sacrifice a lamb. Now, when you came to church today, did you have to give me a, a, a lamb or a, a pigeon to worship God? No. Are you glad about that? I'm glad about that. Why? Because a lamb has already been offered on our behalf. The work of Christ. And for each of you now, Jesus has come as our Passover lamb. He is the lamb who is represented by all those Old Testament sacrifices. And, his, and all, all that story of the Old Testament serves as a picture to show what Jesus would do when he would go on the cross. And you will cleanse our conscience from acts that we feel ashamed of. Jesus, and only Jesus, can cleanse your conscience through his work on the cross. And that means you can approach God with confidence. Confidence. Knowing that your past is dealt with. And that's why after speaking of the ineffectiveness of the old sacrificial systems of the ancient Israelites, the writer of Hebrews then goes on to say, how much more... How much more, then, will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse your consciences from acts that lead to death, so that you may serve the living God? Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing? You don't have to be perfect to please God. <laughs> Just come to him in faith. Trust in what he has done for you. Live that journey of faith. The guy I know, a pastor of a church I know in Dublin, I'm not sure if he's still there, a guy called Noel Kenny. I've mentioned this to some, to some of you before, and you remember uh, when my dad pastored in, in a place called, uh, I think it was called Garden Street in, in Dublin, uh, he had a, a church building he met in that was like a tin roof at the top. And uh, Noel Kenny was a teenager in this part of the north side of Dublin, which is, by the way, is a rough part of Dublin. And uh, when my dad was uh, speaking away, Noel Kenny would throw stones on the tin roof as a teenager, uh, disrupting the service. Ah, teenagers, kids, hey, kids are kids. Anyway, in time, guess what? Noel Kenny comes to faith in Jesus. He comes in the Lord. And guess what? Because God always has the last laugh. Noel Kenny ends up being a pastor of a church in the north side of Dublin. <laughs> Walking amongst these rough ruffians, where, where he was seated, uh, placed, I should say. He's an interesting character. He's a great guy, Noel. Fantastic guy. But anyway, Noel says, because he deal, he's dealing with some heavy issues in that part of Dublin. One, one day, uh, someone, one of his parishioners came to, to Noel and says, uh, Noel, Pastor Noel says, I, I just can't, I'm riddled with guilt from my past. I've done some very bad things throughout my life. And, and Noel says, okay, I'll tell you what. What I want you to do, I'm going to give you a sheet of paper, plain paper. I want you to write out all the sins that you've ever committed. So you write out all the sins. And there were a lot of sins. <laughs> and some of the sins were very big sins. 
and then all got a tub of red paint. And he looked and said, see that sin? Right, I'm going to get some red paint. I'm going to paint over it with red paint. Can you see that sin? He says, no, I can't. Right, let's go to the next one. He went over the next one. Can you see that sin? He says, no, I can't. He went through every one of those sins, completely covered with red paint. Can you see any of those sins? No, Pastor No, I can't. Well, neither can God see your sins. Because when you put your trust in Jesus, your shame is covered. It's covered. What a wonderful gospel we have. What a wonderful gospel we have. And so you, can, you don't have to be perfect to please God when you come to him in faith. And so to approach him without, without shame, let's see him for who he is, that God is holy. Let's, let's see the value he puts upon human life. Let's see Jesus for what he has done. And these men and women of faith of old, in faith, they look forward to the cross. In faith, actually, we look back to the cross. And we see what happened that day, even though we, we weren't that weren't present. When Moses applied the blood of the lamb at the Passover, when the prostitute Rahab tied the scarlet thread around the edge of, of, the, of Jerusalem, they were all pictures looking forward to the day when Jesus' blood would act in their behalf. The faith of Abel, Enoch, Noah, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Rahab, the judges, the prophets, the kings, wasn't just an isolated faith, but it's a faith that we all share in. That we're all part of this collective community of faith that goes right back to the beginning of time. And none of these men and women were perfect. <laughs> none of them had it all together. But as they put their trust in God, somehow the future work of Christ was working on their behalf as it does in our lives. When the writer of Hebrews says that God plans something better for us so that only together, talking about them, with us, they will be made perfect. He highlights the truth that these men and women were made right as they look forward to the cross and as we look back to the cross, but also as we look forward to the day of a new heaven and a new earth and a new world where God is inviting us to be, be part of, where there will be no more sense of shame. And so as we approach God, Listen, if you've got any shame in your life, let me invite you to bring it to Jesus. Because Jesus took our shame on the cross. On that cross, the writer says that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. You see, the cross, it wasn't just a horrendous instrument of slow death by asphyxiation. It wasn't just an instrument of, of torture. It was also an instrument of public shame and humiliation. Thousands of criminals would have been crucified under Roman rule, left on days on end at the end of the streets for the public to see. Sometimes people would mock at them. They would jeer at them. They would spit at them. It was a symbol of shame, of ridicule. And the shame that Jesus experienced on that cross is a picture of our shame when we give it to him. And he takes it from us. In fact, uh, recently, uh, the other day, I was speaking to a guy called uh, John, another Irish guy. <laughs> and um, and uh, he's, he's, he's someone who's gloriously come to faith in Christ. But he, he, he is an out-and-out -out evangelist. An out-and-out -out evangelist. And he, he was saying, and he doesn't care anymore. He, he sold his life to Jesus, all right? <laughs> Uh, he sold his life to Jesus. But he says, sometimes I go through places and I carry a cross when I'm reach, reaching out. And he says, I was in Darlington, he says, recently, and people were spitting at me. <laughs> people were ridiculing me. People were cursing me. He says, no, I'm just going gonna, gonna to take this. Jesus took my shame. I'm carrying this. Jesus took our shame so that we don't have to carry it in our lives anymore. All those things that we feel embarrassed of. And he exchanges it for his honor. And God is in the business of bringing many sons and daughters to glory as he shapes and molds us into the image of his son. 
And since Jesus has been perfected forever as the source of eternal salvation for those who obey him, only Jesus can take away our shame and replace it with his glory. Only Jesus is able to perfect you as a person as you continue in your faith. And when you place your trust in him, God is no longer ashamed to be called your God. That's my boy. That's my daughter. Hey, Gabriel! I'm proud of Amanda. (laughs) Because why? In the right sense of the word. Because when I look upon your life, I don't see your failings or your mistakes. I see Jesus. I see Jesus over you. And I want to encourage you today, if you want to approach God without shame, make sure you've come to the Lord. Let me invite you to turn from everything that you know is wrong in your life, to put your trust in Jesus, to get immersed in water in his name, to open your heart, receive of his Holy Spirit in your life, and realize that you don't have to be perfect to please God when you come to him in faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and your goodness and your mercy and your love for all of us here today, Lord. Uh, We thank you that, Lord, that none of us here stands condemned. (laughs) Thank you that there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Thank you that we all can live in the fullness of the life that you have for every one of us here. And I pray, Lord God, for anyone here this morning who just feels they're still weighed by you know, things that were said or done, Lord, I pray that, Lord, that you'll give them the strength to hand it to you. Jesus, when you was on that cross, you experienced the shame of that cross. You took our shame upon ourselves, on yourself so that we can live a life free from shame. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the beautiful cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If there's anyone uh, here or watching online and and you've not yet come to that place of uh, surrendering your life to Jesus, um, I'm going to invite you just to to pray this prayer after me in your heart. Lord Jesus Christ, I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong in my life. Please forgive me. I now turn from everything that I know is wrong. Thank you that you died on the cross for me so that I can be forgiven and set free. Thank you that you offer me forgiveness and the gift of your spirit. I now receive that gift and invite you to come into my life by your Holy Spirit and to be with with me forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.